Good afternoon. Welcome to the marathon session here. We have a review today, and I'm going to review briefly anything from lecture 20 to the last lecture. And anything I say today can be part of the midterm. Anything I say on Monday could also be part of the midterm if it's nothing new, OK? If it's something new, new material, it will be not part of the midterm, all right? So the last time, we talked about the free energy and the equilibrium. And we have this reaction here. Reaction A, A plus B gives product C plus D. So reactants gives products. And we know if this delta G naught, that means at standard state at one atmosphere, and at room temperature, this is our standard state at the moment, this would be, what would that be in order for it to be spontaneous? Any answers here? Negative, has to be negative. Now with this, when it is in equilibrium, once it has reacted and it's in equilibrium, what would be K? Would be K smaller or larger than one? So K is the concentration of this divided by the concentration of this. Is K larger or smaller than one? Is larger than one, okay? And now if we have the opposite case, if this reaction does not go, it's not spontaneous, what would be delta G not? Positive and K, so this divided, this here divided by this, K would be larger or smaller than one? Smaller than one, okay? And there's the rare case which doesn't really happen, but just for completeness, I'm mentioning this. So you could have delta G naught, delta G naught zero, but that would mean that you have a reaction where everything is at one molar or everything is at one atmosphere. And it would be in equilibrium in this condition, OK, which is a very rare thing. So if you would have that, that means uh, your delta G naught would be 0. And what would be K? It would be 1. So that's a rare case. It really doesn't happen very often, all right? Uh, so we wanted to marry delta G naught with delta K, or we see, you see the inter, inter uh, action between delta G naught and K. And so delta G naught is minus R, that's the gas constant, times the temperature, times the ln of K, OK? The natural logarithms of K. And if you take this uh, to the e's power, to the base of E, so you get K equals the E function here, times uh, E function, and this is the, the function, minus delta G naught divided by RT. OK, so we have married now delta G with L and K, and we have seen that it's dependent of each other. And so they are related. And now we're going to talk about the free energy and the dependence of te uh, uh, temperature. So that's the free energy, free Gibbs free energy. And when I take this here, when I take this here, so this is minus RT ln K. But delta G, you know, also is another expression. What could that be? Delta G is delta H naught minus T times delta S naught, OK? So if we set this equal here, if I take this G away and say delta H naught minus T times delta S naught is minus RT ln K, and then I rearrange this, I get an equation like this here. I get ln K as a function of temperature. And with this, I get delta H, delta H naught. I get minus delta H R. What is that here? If I have a linear equation, that's a linear equation. That's the slope. So that's a negative slope in this case if delta H is positive. And this would be a positive slope. So you divide this by R, and then you get delta S naught and delta H naught. So let's do an example. You have. Delta H is positive, and we go here, we, we compare delta G and L and K both over the temperature. This is the temperature directly, and this is 1 over the temperature. So if the temperature would be 0, which it never could be, you would be at infinity. You would be somewhere out there. And if the temperature is very, very large, let's say 10 million degrees, then it would be an extremely small number. It would be very close to 0. This allows that us to extrapolate to 0. OK, so let's see. We have delta G is, delta H is positive, and delta S is 
negative. So that would be where would the uh, where does uh, what would be the slope? Huh? The slope would be negative. You are sure? If delta E is, is negative, delta S is negative. That would be a negative slope. Delta S is supposed to be a, a positive, and the slope is minus delta S. Okay, so what should that be? Okay, and delta H, would that be here or here? Would be here, positive, okay? Delta, delta H would, de would be the intercept here. So this is the slope, and that slope is minus delta S, okay? The slope is minus delta S, and delta S is negative, so that's the slope then, all right? So let's do that L and K. L and K, so this is would be the slope, and this would be the intercept. So delta S is negative. Where would be the intercept? Somewhere here, is that right? And the slope would be positive or negative? Oh, so we didn't do that slope, or did I lose that slope? No. OK, that slope would be negative? Correct. That slope is negative, all right? And so you can go and do all those here. And I will spare you this, but you know you get the drift how to do this, OK? So. So we know now the delta G versus the temperature. And when we have delta G versus the temperature, and we have L and K versus 1 over T, OK? So what would be, if you think about it, if we look at the equilibrium constant, equilibrium constant, and if it's exothermic, is heat a product or a reactant? Heat is a product. So if you add heat, if you add heat, that means you increase the temperature. You know what happens here. What happens with the equilibrium constant? It goes down, because if you add product, then you are in the denominator, OK? And you add more in the denominator. Heat would be product. No. Yeah, heat would be product. And you have, what is it? So you have product over product over reactant. You, reactant, okay? So if you add heat, you make more reactants, okay? So your denominator becomes larger, and with this, with your K, gets smaller. Did you get that? Okay, got it. Good. All righty. So, and if we have an endothermic reaction, heat is what? is reactant, OK? So you add reactant. What happens to your K? You add reactant. Now it's in. What happens to your K if you add reactant? It goes towards product, OK? So now your nu uh, uh, numerator is larger than the denominator, and so it becomes K becomes larger. So this is how you can explain that. And then we talked about the running free energy. Where is it running? Okay. So we have talked about this at one molar, but this is not what it happens. You start your reaction, and then until it is equilibrium, the free energy of your uh, reactants of your reactants goes down, and the free energy of your products increases. Okay. And it goes as this goes down, this goes up until the free energy is no difference anymore then you have equilibrium. So delta G is 0. That's a v in every equilibrium. But it's not delta G naught is 0, OK? Delta G is 0. Delta G naught is not 0, because then you would have to have everything at one molar or one atmosphere. So delta G for any reaction that is in equilibrium is 0, with this Q equals K. So this goes up here, this goes down the free energy, and this goes up until they meet and become 0, and then it's in equilibrium. Or you can also have delta G larger than 0, then Q is larger than K. This is quite clear. So with this, we have tied down the running free energy with the reaction quotient, OK? And so the running free energy is delta G is delta G naught plus RT. Ln. This is your reaction quotient, OK? And in equilibrium, this will become K. And what will be delta G without the naught be in equilibrium? 
Okay, this will be zero. So we, we can say delta G equals zero is delta G naught plus RT ln K, okay? So you have that equation now. The running free uh, energy, Gibbs free energy, and the standard Gibbs free energy. So this is what we did here. Now I have a question for you. The question is, we have an, equili we have an equilibrium. There's a reaction, actually, first. We have a reaction A plus 2B gives C. So they're obviously reacting. B gets smaller, and A gets smaller, and C grows. And you see here, the equilibrium starts. There's no more change in the reactants here. But here at T1, at this time here, suddenly something happened here. Okay, what happened? This is the concentration. So now tell me, is at this point, at this time, time here, when I look at that reaction, something happened. Think what could have happened, okay? Anything is possible to get to this condition and think about what this is. So you have suddenly, this one has increased here. This here has increased again. So you have got it out of equilibrium, essentially. Now, the question is now, is Q, is Q larger than K at this point here? Is Q equals to K or is Q smaller than K? Why don't you think about this and then give me your answer. You should have that right, actually, in the first try. So you do, at this point, you just take the concentration of this, the concentration of this, and the concentration of this, and then compare it with each other if this is. Is this an equilibrium there? No, it just got out of equilibrium. Something happened. No, oh, that's the wrong one. <laughs> Be clear, I, got, I got the wrong one. I left it in my office. No, this one here. There you go. <laughs> I have so many memory sticks in it. <laughs> <laughs> no memory. <laughs> So Q and K is just the quotient of the concentrations. Just put the concentrations in there and compare it with, with K. Okay, You form a new Q and compare it with K. Is it larger or smaller? Okay, a majority goes for C. Q is smaller than K. Q is small. When would Q smaller than, be smaller than K? If I increase, if I increase this here, isn't that right? Okay, I think I go with that. And let's do C. So, can anybody tell me what happened there? Where did that come from? Tell me. I increased the reactant, so how did I do that? I opened the, 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 the stop car, uh, stopper there and put some more of B in there, okay? That's all there was at this point. And then I let it go back into equilibrium, okay? So with this here, I increased this here, and this is now in the denominator of our Q, okay? So that will be now smaller because this is larger than it was in equilibrium, so I have more of this. So I divide this as, as constant, but this is more. It's not in equilibrium. With this, Q is smaller than K. Yes. So then we talked about the kinetic theory of gases. In lecture 20, I'm going now back to after the midterm. In lecture 20, we talked about the kinetic theory of gases. We say that a gas consists of identical, and these are well-separated particles, so there's a low number density. There's lots of room for an ideal gas. And they move in random directions with a distribution of speeds. They move in straight lines. They don't go zigzag. When they hit each other, before they hit each other, they move in straight lines between collisions. And the collisions between the particles or walls are elastic. That means there is no loss of kin kinetic energy. Energy is conserved. Inelastic collisions would be there would be if you hit with your with your with your car, you hit another car. 
that's an inelastic collision, okay? Because uh, first of all, you come to a stop, and second, uh, you are heat is liberated, okay? When you do that, you can't feel it, but there's heat liberated. You feel the heat when you get out of the car, uh, okay? <laughs> all right. So, and then we talked. Uh, we had the kinetic theory of gases, and we derived this. And what we have seen is that P times V is N times R times T. Or for one molar, it's this here. If I, so the kinetic energy of one molecule is directly proportional to the temperature. This is a constant. This is a constant. It's just a function of the temperature. And Kb is the Boltzmann constant, which is the ideal gas constant divided by the Avogadro number. Okay, and if I say for one mole, I say this, for one mole, okay, I just have R because I multiply this with N and I get R in there. So the kinetic energy is just proportional to the temperature, okay, for an ideal gas. So if I give you the temperature, you can tell me what the energy is. If I give you the energy, you can tell me what the temperature is. Now. If I give you the mass and the velocity, can you tell me what the temperature is? Of course you do. Of course you do. The mass and the velocity. So the energy is 1 half times the mass mv times the velocity squared. OK? But we have an ideal gas. You have to be careful what kind of velocity you use. OK? So now you have that e, and you can calculate this. And now you can equal, put the set is equal to RT, and with this you can get T out of it, okay? If you know the velocity and the mass of your particle, you can calculate the temperature. So, and the energy increases with, with increasing temperature and decreases with decreasing temperature. We all know that now. So we talked about the velocity, and we have this root mean square velocity. This is what we have to deal with because that's how we derive this kinetic gas theory. And this is a square, mean square velocity was 3 kb times t divided by m, or for one mole, it was 3 r times t divided by the molar mass. But we can't do anything, especially if you want to calculate the energy from the velocity. So you get the mass and now the velocity. You take the root mean square velocity and square it, OK? The root mean square velocity, so we know these are constants. The root mean square velocity is just the square of this, the square of this, and the square of this, OK? And now you have the root mean square velocity, OK? So, and the root mean square velocity, velocity is proportional directly over the square root of t and indirect proportional over the square root of m, okay? Indirect to the square root of m. Inversely proportional, not in indirect. Inversely proportional, okay? So this is important here, this stuff, all right? I think it's even given in your formula sheet at the beginning. So now we're talking a little bit more about the velocity distribution. So these gases, they have an we have this root mean squared velocity, so it's a distribution of velocities. And if you have a low speed, so there's a distribution function which describes, which is described uh, as, as an E function here. So this would be the probability of distribution. Uh, so this would be, for example, at a low temperature, okay? You have a low temperature, and or you can have uh, also very, if you, you compare temperature, you can compare the temperature, you say that would be a low temperature situation. Or you have very heavy atoms or molecules, that would, that would be heavy molecules, okay? They don't move that fast. At, at, uh, and now you could have then a higher temperature, or you have much lighter uh, atoms. That would be, so don't confuse this. This is not high T and low temperature, it's high T or uh, high, t high temperature or low mass. So this, you can look at this two ways, OK? And so this is, you would have quite a bit more faster. And you see these speeds, what were they about of these gases? I raised iodine. Anybody remembers what was this? 10 meters per second, 100 meters per second, 1,000 meters per second. Anybody has an idea of the speed of gases at room temperature? 
So I four or five hundred meters it was about. Yeah. I couldn't I couldn't win, okay? All right, when I raced it. So and then you have the root mean square speed, that's the velocity. If you have the mass and the velocity, you can calculate the energy. All right? So that would be the root. It's not directly in the in the center point, the root mean square velocity. So then we talked about real gases, and real gases don't behave like ideal gases. That was a profound sentence, <laughs> OK? Uh, ideal gases are always gases. There's no way that they condense or anything. But real gases can condense. They can become liquids, and you ha can have a phase change. You go from the liquid to the gas and from the gas to the liquid. That's the difference. So this would be water at a certain temperature, a pretty high temperature, as a function of volume and pressure. That's the PV relationship. What is that Boyle's relationship? P times V is a constant. And with this, this behaves ideal water. But when you go to a certain temperature, and the temperature is called the critical temperature, and you are right there or below the critical temperature, Real gases don't behave ideal anymore, OK? They suddenly change in there. You have a phase change here. So you can, for example, compress this here, because here you have exactly the, you go from the uh, uh, gases to the liquid phase. You have that phase change. So you can compress it without any pressure change. You see that? And then it goes up again. And so at, let's see, at 100 degrees, what would be the pressure here? If we take water, what would be the pressure? Come on. One atmosphere. One atmosphere, exactly. And at 25 degrees, that's the vapor pressure on top of it. And at 25 degrees, what would be that here? 0 0.003, 0 .003, exactly. OK. All righty. <laughs> so, so there is now these real gases. They display volume, and they display interactions between the molecules, OK? So there is forces, intermolecular forces that act. And if we then have our, want to simulate, again, ideal behavior, we have to correct the pressure and the volume uh, in order to get back to ideal conditions. We have to uh, subtract from the volume. We have adjust this for the finite volume of the molecules, and we adjust this for the collisions and the attractions. So the pressure is lower, so we have to add that. And this, because we have volume, it is smaller than the real uh, volume, OK? Then the ideal, uh, uh, the real volume is larger than the ideal volume, OK? So you have then these coefficients here, and you put those in, and then you get the corrected uh, Van der Waals equation. And this will give you then, again, ideal behavior, OK? So we talked then about the third phase of water. And the third phase of water is we had liquid and gas, and we have solid, all right? And we have solid water. And this point here is the critical temperature, OK? The critical temperature. That means the critical temperature, if I'm here in temperature and pressure, would I have an ideal gas behavior? OK. If I'm here, I would have real, ga real, real gas behavior, OK? This would be ideal gas behavior. This would be real gas behavior. OK, we have the three phases as a function of temperature. They are at lower temperatures. You have the solid and the gas in equilibrium. This is this line. You have the solid and the liquid in equilibrium. This is this equilibrium line. And you have the liquid and the gas in equilibrium, OK? So the liquid and the solid is the one we use the most, and we have used this quite a bit. Uh, it does not, what how you call this process if it goes from the solid to the gas? Sublimation. Water does not sublime, OK? And so <coughs> there is a point. So what, what is so specific about the phase diagram of water? What is specific compared uh, to other phase diagrams? Has a negative slope. The negative slope is? When I increase the pressure at the same temperature, let's see at the freezing point, that would be zero degrees Celsius, I have water with ice, and now I increase the pressure, I suddenly get liquid again. And this is the advantage we have with water. That way you can ice skate in the winter. 
water freezes from the top, bodies of water freeze from the top to the bottom. Otherwise, they would freeze from the bottom to the top if this would be positive, and we would be in deep trouble. We would have to, every year, we would have to uh, <coughs> have these processes that make life important uh, repeat themselves. So we would really not be that developed. Okay, so there is also that point, the triple point. This is a fixed temperature. In this case, this is the temperature and the fixed pressure. And they are all phases can coexist with each other. And I've shown that to you with uh, CO2, where we had liquid CO2, solid CO2, and gases CO2 all at the same time present. So then in lecture 22, we talked about the first law of thermodynamic. And we talked about the change in energy is the change of heat plus work that the system can do. And the work that it does is, my, if it does, it's for ex uh, pressure work, we call this, it has to expand against an external pressure, so the volume changes, and this is called the uh, volume pressure work, volume work essentially. And we have a new state function, this is not a, a, a state function, it's the energy, this is state function, I have defined what state function is. Uh, we are only interested in state function, in the initial and final state, we don't care how we get there. Initial and final state. I gave you an example where I took a trip to from here to Colorado, and I could take a directly fly to Colorado. So I'm initial state is here, final state is Denver, Colorado, or I could drive ho halfway through the United States and make a nice sighting to it. At the end, at the end state, I still will be in Denver, Colorado. Okay, so it doesn't matter how you get there as long as we compare only initial and final state. So we say that the energy of the universe, that's the energy that was there at after the Big Bang, is not changing, okay? It rearranges itself, but it's not changing. So if you have a system, and we looked at systems and the surrounding, that gives me the change of the energy of the universe, and this has to be zero. That's the conservation of energy, okay? So we say there was this, these, uh, first law of thermodynamics, we looked at the system, a gas system, and then we say the change in energy is the heat that flows in and out of the system and the work that the system can do or can be done on it. So if heat flows out of the system, what happens to its internal energy? The internal energy goes up or down? Down, okay. Now, if heat flows into the system, what happens to the internal energy? It goes up, okay? All right. So now, if the system does work, the system, oh, that's, let's do it. The system does work. What happens to the internal energy of that system? It goes down, okay? So it cools off because it does work, okay? Now, if the system uh, has done work on it, so that means you compress it, has, has done work on it, what does happens to the internal energy? Goes up, exactly. So, so E is a state function, we said that already, we conserve energy because, and this we we're going to talk a little bit more about this, we, I already said that here, and with this we can go on and talk about, for example, the isothermal expansion and the compression. So if we have an isothermal expansion, let's see if this, okay, an isothermal expansion, so the system does work. It expands against an outside pressure, okay? What happens to the internal energy of the system? It does work. What happens to the internal energy? Internal energy goes down, okay? So that means the temperature goes down, all right? And so if the temperature goes down, but I want to keep it isothermal, I have to have heat flowing in. Heat has to flow in. So it does work and heat has to flow in, okay? That would be the expansion. Now we do the, if I expand against the zero, is there, uh, against zero, is there work done against the vacuum? There is no work done, okay? You expand against nothing, right? No work done. So the system stays actually the same in temperature. So we can also have a compression, so work is done on the system. What happens to the temperature of the system? The temperature of the system? increases, 
temperature of the system increases. Now it has more energy also. So I want to be isothermal. That means it has to keep the same temperature. How can I accommodate this? I have to flow heat, heat out until the temperature is the same again, or the energy is the same again. So that would be the compression. Work is done on the system, increases the energy, increases the temperature, and now we want to be isothermal at the same temperature. Heat has to flow out. Okay, good. Now we have an adiabatic expansion and compression. Adiabatic means I cannot exchange heat. So with this, Q equals zero. So if I do an expansion, so the system does work, okay? The system does work. What happens? The energy of the system goes down. There is no heat flowing, so I can't replenish it. Energy goes down. If I have a compression, what happens to the energy? Goes up, exactly. And so that means its work is done on the system. Work is larger than zero, it flows into the system, and energy goes up of the system. That means the temperature goes up, okay? This is adiabatic, no exchange of heat. So then we talked about lecture 20 at lecture 23, and I better step on it. We talked about thermochemistry, and we have a new state function, the enthalpy. This is essentially the energy of the system at constant outside pressure. That's the enthalpy, because it's much more convenient if we do a chemical reaction, we have one atmosphere of outside pressure. We say, okay, this is our new state function. We derived it, how we get to that. And so if heat is absorbed, that means what happens? Heat flows into the system. That's the red arrow. What is that? It's an endothermic reaction, okay? Endothermic reaction, heat would be product or reactant? Reactant, okay. Exothermic reaction is the opposite. Heat is released, flows out of the system. That means heat is a product, and if I increase, never mind, heat is a product, okay? So this would be smaller than zero. And we have talked about the standard enthalpies of formation to calculate these changes in standard state, to see if there's heat. We need heat to flow into the system in order to make it go, or the system will release heat, and this is when we had these beautiful explosions, so they were exothermic then. Um, so we dis decided that the heat of formation, that's our, our agreement, the heat of formation at standard state for elements in standard state is zero, okay? And we know now we can, standard state is one molar or one atmosphere and the specified temperature. So the heat of the reaction at standard state is the sum of the heat of formation of the products. Don't forget the moles to put in there, minus the sum of the heat of formation of the reactants. And you can look those up, and they are all tabulated, okay? And with this, you see if that reaction is exo or endothermic. And so if it's endothermic, endothermic Q is larger than, uh, than zero, that means endothermic. Delta H is larger than zero, that means heat flows Endothermic means heat flows, to, flows into the system. Exothermic means heat flows out of the system and the heat is released. Delta H is smaller than zero. We said this a thousand times, okay? So standard states you know also. And then we talked about the, the element in their standard states. They, you have the reactants and the product, so you uh, calculate the heat of formation of the reactants and the heat of formation, the sum of the heat of formation of the, the, the product. And then you take the difference for that reaction at standard state, okay, is the sum of the products minus the reactants. And here are some heat of formations. We've seen they are negative for some, for the uh, formation of iron oxide, for example, the formation of aluminum oxide from aluminum and oxygen, or iron and oxygen. And these are very large numbers, and you remember the thermite reaction, where we had this tremendous amount of heat released when uh, we converted uh, iron uh, and aluminum uh, to the oxide and to the iron, okay? So you see here, if you have hydrogen and oxygen, so this is the elements in their natural state, we, ca uh, we say, is zero. So if you want to make one hydrogen, you have to break that bond, and if you break bond, you have a positive energy. You need 
energy to break bonds. You gain energy by making iron, by from uh, you using iron and oxide to make iron oxide, Fe2 and 3. We are making bonds and we release minus 824 kilojoules per mole. So then we talked at the heat capacity at lecture 24. You know the heat capacity is can be per per specific heat capacity, uh, per mole or per gram, okay? And you know, you did these calorimetric measurements, you need to be able to calculate this, the change in heat uh, in a calorimeter, and you remember you had your, your constant for the calorimeter, and so these are, are the tools for this, and you need to be able to calculate that. So then we have lecture 25, and this is an... Ah, so I had something for the heat capacity for you here. So this is the heat capacity that's required to raise the temperature of an object by one degree. And of course, it varies from material to material. It, it tells you how much heat a certain material can hold, OK? And the specific heat then is per gram of substance. So there's a CS. There should be a S there, like this here. And the uh, molar heat capacity is per mole. There should be a little m here. And this is your formula for calculating the uh, heat uh, exchange. So we had then lecture 25 where we talked about the enthalpy of reactions from bond energy. Why was this good? What was that good for? So we first, we break bonds. We calculate the energy it takes to, to break these bonds. And then we make the new bonds and we calculate energy, how much energy we get the, for making this bond, how much energy we get, get out of this, okay? And the difference will give, give us our heat of reaction and uh, it will be the, the energy that you have uh, ne uh, needed to for the reactants to break the bonds minus the energy of the heat of the products which is a negative number to break to break these uh, to make no to make these bonds so if you break bonds you need energy if you make bonds you gain energy all right and so this is good for uh, certain, re uh, certain things for the mi uh, microbiologists, uh, biochemists, uh, molecular and cell biologists, they have these huge molecules, huge. And they cannot, they are not existing. Each of them, the heat of formation it has not been measured. So, but there is one reactive center, and in this reactive center, usually a couple of bonds are broken, and it's reformulated, and a couple of new bonds are formed. And so these biologists, or the, these biochemists, they look at this, and say, Oh, they calculate this. So, uh, uh -huh, this is uh, exothermic. Okay? So this is what they did. They said, I break this bond, and I break this bond, and I break that, and this, and it's this much, and I make this bond and this bond. It's that much, so I take the, the difference, and with this, I know if it's positive or negative. I know if it's exothermic or endothermic. So you have your reactants. You can also measure directly the heat of reaction to go from the reactants to the products. Or you can just break the bonds of the reactants, make atoms, and then reformulate these atoms to form new bonds and get the products. And with this, you have the two parameters that you need in order to calculate that heat of reaction. So this is a perfect example for a state function. Okay? You, can, you can start from reactants, add with product. You can go it this way by, make it, by breaking and making bonds, or you can measure it directly. Okay? And uh, so this is also how you could make this for compounds. So you see here, these are real uh, numbers. To break an H2 bond, it's 436 kilojoules per mole. To break all these bonds here, when there's no carbon involved, these are absolute numbers. But the moment that carbon is involved, these are averages. Because this carbon bond is very dependent on its chemical environment. What is the bound to the next around the carbon? And so these are averages, but they are pretty good averages. And you see here, of course, they're all positive because you have to break them, you know? And then in lecture 26, we talked about the second third law of thermodynamics. That means the change of the entropy of the universe is the change of the entropy of the system plus the change of the entropy of the surrounding. It is always larger than zero. So we're heading for complete chaos, okay? And the... the Entropy is not conserved. Energy is conserved. At the end, you have all the, the, uh, uh, the whole universe is in total disorder, and you, there's no more order where you can transfer 
heat from one system to another because they're all in disorder, okay? So, but the entropy is larger than zero or equal to zero. The entropy is an equal to zero that would be reversible, that would be an equilibrium. Smaller than zero, the entropy of the universe, okay? The entropy of the universe can never be smaller than it was after the Big Bang, okay? It's constantly increasing. So then we talk about the isothermal expansion. So you expand isothermally, you do, the system does work. That means heat has to, flee, uh, uh, to flow in. Wait, wait, wait. Heat has to flow in. What does this do if heat flows in? Does the entropy of the system increase or decrease? It increases. The entropy of the surrounding does decrease, okay? And if you have now a compression, you know, work is done on the system, is isothermal, so the energy increases. I have to flow out heat, okay? Q is uh, smaller than zero because it flows out. And with this now, you have more order, okay? The entropy is smaller than zero of the system, okay? But you're flowing heat out. That means you increase the entropy of your surrounding, okay? Good. I'm about to fade, I can't speak anymore. <laughs> okay, lecture 27, we, uh, we introduced yet another state function, the Gibbs free energy, and now we can report the entropy of the universe. Uh, we report, we, we use the entropy of the universe uh, to talk about what we know about the system. So delta G naught is the Gibbs free energy, and the Gibbs free energy at standard state is the change, the change of it is the change of the uh, enthalpy at standard state minus the temperature times the entropy at standard state, uh, state change. All right? So what you can have here, you can have the uh, enthalpy, delta G is H mi delta H minus T delta S. The entropy can be, oh, okay, standard state first. The, <laughs> the entropy can be uh, negative, uh, the enthalpy can be negative, or positive. The entropy can be increasing or decreasing of your system, okay? But you never will have a spontaneous reaction if the entropy, you will have a spontaneous reaction if the free energy decreases a smaller than zero, but there is no way that you have any reaction going in the direction you have written, it, have it written if delta G is larger than zero, delta G not, okay? And with this, you can also calculate the delta G of your reaction at standard state, the Gibbs free energy of reaction. It's again the sum of the Gibbs free energy of the products at standard state minus the sum of the Gibbs free energy of the reactants at standard state. That gives you that number, okay? And if it's negative, that means it's a go. It's spontaneous. If it's positive, it's no go. So we have lecture 28 where we talked about the law of mass action and we have played with this already with Q and K. So if Q is smaller than K, what is Q is smaller than K. Q is smaller than K. So K would, so we have more of those here, okay? That means we need to make more products. Products are favored. If Q is larger than K, you have too many, uh, too many products, that means you need to, in order to get in equilibrium, you need to go to the left side. That means reactants are favored, okay? Now let me ask you a question. And this question is, we have, remember iodine, and the, we talked last time about iodine, and I compared it with CO2. This might help you here. Um, I have these, a cylinder of iodine, and is, it has a certain color here, blue or purple, and I increase the temperature of this. What will happen to the color intensity? I increase the temperature of that system. What will happen to the color intensity? Will it increase, stay the same, or decrease? So you know how to write the reaction quotient of this, don't you? You should know how to write the reaction quotient. How interesting that he brings another chem quiz towards the end, huh?
So what I would ask myself, I would ask myself, is heat a product or a reactant? And I don't see that there is a whole lot of heat. There's no heat given off. Didn't we talk at the beginning about the equilibrium constant as a function of temperature? Okay. So when I increase the temperature, what happens to the equilibrium constant? If I decrease the temperature, what happens to the equilibrium constant? Okay, let's see. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> I think you need to think about this. You see, is, you think this is exothermic? Exothermic U is free, I stand far away and it explodes, okay? I don't see that. You think this is exothermic? If it would be exothermic, heat would be a product, is that right? If it would be endothermic, heat would be a reactant. And depending what it is, you push it into the opposite direction, according to Le Chatelier's principle. Why don't you discuss this with each other and give me please the right answer? So you know how this equilibrium quotient looks like? This is just the partial pressure of this here, because this is a solid. Is heat a reactant or a product? They say it's a reactant. What do you say? Reactant or product? Reactant? Okay. So if it's a reactant, then you should know the answer maybe. Do you say reactant or product? Heat is a reactant or product in this case. Okay, everybody says down there reactant. I have no notes. They couldn't have seen my notes, okay? Very good. <laughs> okay. So let's see if you're right. Don't listen to me, not all the time, okay? So you said it increases, yeah? Okay. Good. You were steadfast. <laughs> So let's heat that baby up here. You see anything changing? Don't see anything changing? You sure? Is the picture up there? Don't see anything changing? What's happening? It increases, of course. It makes more gas. All right. So let's see if you can see this. Yes, it's right there, okay, and this is, was your answer. This was your answer. The 
system increased, okay? All right. So let me talk about Lishati, the principal, and you know all this. I see you on Monday. Have a nice weekend.